So welcome everyone. Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, with us tonight, we have Dr. Marcus Studley, and I usually have the speaker kind of briefly introduce themselves, kind of explain why they get interested in Chiari, uh related disorders. And then I'm actually gonna go away. So while you introduce yourself, I'm gonna kind of disappear, then you'll do your presentation, then we'll take some question and answers. So uh, whenever you're ready. Okay, thanks, Caitlin. So uh, I'm a neurosurgeon in Sydney, Australia, and my interest in this field has come from uh, a desire to try to understand what causes syringomyelia. So um, I started looking at that with research um, during my, my neurosurgery training, and uh, that's really just led to, which is an ongoing field of research for me and my team. And that's led to obviously a, a very close interest in Chiari malformation, but also other causes of syringomyelia. So I, I chose this topic because, um, you know, particularly for the, from the patient's perspective, this may not be um, clear, but basically we don't know what we're trying to achieve. And that, that's the, the bottom line here in the message here is that we really don't know what the underlying mechanisms are for most of the things that we're trying to treat for both Chiari patients and, and syringomyelia patients. So I will, I'll, what I'm going to go through is some of the things that we do know and, and just point out the things that we don't know and how that really impacts on the kinds of decisions we make and the types of surgery that we do. And I, and I think really explains why there is such a wide variety of, of surgical techniques around the world. Um, so I don't have any disclosures other than that um, in Sydney we've been in lockdown for over three months and we're not allowed to get our hair cut. So I look like a caveman because um, my hair is as long as as long as it's ever been since I was 17. All right. So in terms of the things that um, we're trying to help patients with with um, the common surgery for Chiari malformation is Sometimes we're trying to fix brainstem dysfunction. That means the um, things that are going wrong in the connection between the brain and the spinal cord. But that's uncommon. And I will talk about that and show some pictures about that. But that's an uncommon problem. Much more common, of course, is headache associated syringomyelia and, of course, brain fog. And, and I'll talk about each of those. And in the process, there are things that um, that we want to hopefully avoid. So infections, CSF leaks, pseudomeningocele that you'll, many of you will be aware of as a, as a potential problem. The cerebellum falling into the spine becoming worse with too much uh, surgery or with scarring or cerebellar tethering that happens after, after some operations. So, so there's the two aspects, what we are trying to achieve and then the things we're trying to, trying to avoid. So just to start with the brainstem compression, so the image on the left here shows a very abnormal angle at the base of the skull, and that causes compression of the brainstem here. So there's the Chiari malformation. And what's abnormal here is the compression of the front or the anterior aspect of the brainstem, and that can cause double vision, difficulty swallowing, weakness, a um, whole range of symptoms, but a very specific problem related to that compression. And in the old days, often an approach to treat that would have been to come do an operation through the mouth. So this is the back of the, the throat here. And if you go through the mouth, you could um, go through the back of the throat, remove this bony, these bony structures here, and then turn the patient over and do a fusion. Um, the reality is that for most patients, if you do a simple, uh, straightforward posterior fossa decompression as here. So this is the same patient where we've done a, a decompression. It allows the brainstem to move backwards and it's no longer being compressed. And, uh, and the symptoms either get better or at least stabilize. Um, and, and that's usually sufficient. And some patients can have really terrible looking scans. So this is a teenage boy who's had surgery done, done elsewhere for Chiari malformation and the syrinx, which didn't get better, which is why he's come and see me, but, but really a really abnormal angle at the base of the skull. And you might look at that and think that re something really needs to be done about that. 
the reality is he was completely asymptomatic, even from the syrinx, from the Chiari. He's a young man, perfectly fit and healthy, no symptoms whatsoever. And so we had some concern about the risk to him of the syrinx uh, persisting, but there really was no need to do anything about that skull base angle. And that's what makes this, this field so difficult because you'll all be aware that there's a lot of focus now on craniosomacal junction abnormalities and particularly those angles, but there are many patients with abnormal angles who have no symptoms. And so the imaging is not sufficient on its own for us to be able to tell whether or not a patient needs treatment. So, so my own approach is that for patients with, um, with brainstem compression, usually they get better with just a simple decompression. And, and in some patients, and here's an example of a patient with the head in flexion and the head in extension, and clearly there's a change in the craniosacral junction. And so there is some degree of instability and that is the kind of patient where we would move forward with a fusion, but that's a very small number of patients. So that's, brain, that's brainstem compression. And I think most neurosurgeons in the world would agree that the, the clinical presentation for those patients is pretty straightforward and, and that decompression is appropriate by whatever means. The problem with Chiari and Syringomyelia is that the rest of the clinical uh, scenario is not so straightforward. And so headache as the most common presentation. Uh, so here's a, a patient with Chiari malformation and a decompression will usually uh, make the headache better. But the question is why? <laughs> we don't really know what, uh, what, is making, what is making the headache better. Is it that there is compression of the cerebellum and when you take that compression away, the headache gets better? Is it that CSF is not able to flow across the craniosurbacal junction and afterwards CSF is able to flow? Or is it, as we've been looking at recently, that for patients with Chiari malformation, the cerebellum stretches. So if you look at the top of the cerebellum, with each heartbeat, it's not moving. But the tip of the cerebellum, the tonsils, is moving with each heartbeat. And so the cerebellum is really stretching. And we're doing some work at the moment looking at what happens with cough and showing that it stretches even more. So it's possible that the actual mechanism of headache is stretching of the cerebellum and nothing to do with CSF flow, nothing to do with compression. And that the, what happens after a decompression is that the cerebellum stops stretching. I mean, that's yet to be proven, but that's, I think, just illustrating that we really don't have a good handle on what is causing the headache. And if it is that, then techniques such as resecting the tonsils will be very effective, uh, even without restoring CSF flow. So it's a, it's a big unknown. And then, of course, it comes, you come to the many different types of surgery that, that are done. And one of, the, one of the big things is, do you open the dura and put in a patch or do you just take out the bone? And in terms of dealing with headache, there doesn't seem to be much difference. And so this is a, a publication from a few years ago now, looking at the difference between posterior fossa decompression, meaning bone only, and posterior fossa decompression with duraplasty, meaning opening the dura and putting in a patch graft. And the way these graphs, these graphs demo, uh, show the data is for each of the published papers, they look at the results and then sort of collate them all together. And this line here would indicate that there's no difference. And so if there is a difference between one technique versus the other, you would tend to see that over all of the series, the publications, that there would be a, a tendency for, um, for the patients to do better with one or the other. And I think what this shows is there's really not a lot of difference between bone only and duroplasty when you're looking at headache. And so what we do uh, though is a, is a decompression. We do a duroplasty for certainly for adults. And my experience is that that's, that's usually very effective for typical Chiari headache. There are many patients though who have ongoing headache and that can be because of occipital neuralgia so meaning the pain coming from the nerves at the back of the scalp, from intracranial pressure, so either benign intracranial hypertension or idiopathic intracranial hypertension, pseudotumor, that all, the, all those names are the same, mean the same thing. Um, and these are often patients who, right from the start, we're not certain whether the headache is the primary problem or whether it is, whether the Chiari is the primary problem or whether it is related to the intracranial pressure problem. 
And so after decompression, they may have ongoing symptoms, not from the Chiari, but from raised pressure. And then of course, there's the question of craniosubarchal junction hypermobility, which is, a, as I've hopefully tried to show you, is a very difficult thing to, to pin down. And what I've noticed for patients who've had their surgery done elsewhere that come and see me with ongoing headache, other things are that the decompression has not been large enough, it's been too large and there is slump, that the CSF is not controlled, they've got pseudomeningus heal, or the cerebellum is stuck to the patch graft. And I'll show you some examples. So here is a patient who's had a post defossa decompression done elsewhere. And if you look at this superficially, you may say, well, there's CSF there, what's wrong? The problem is that the dura is that line there and the CSF is on the outside of the dura. So this patient has had a small decompression, the, they put in a patch, CSF is leaking out of the patch, the cerebellum is stuck to that patch graft and there is CSF on the outside. So I think the original surgeon looked at that and said, look, this is fine, there's CSF behind the cerebellum because in their mind, that's what they're trying to achieve. But what I'm trying to point out is we don't know what we're trying to achieve. And I think that having CSF on the outside of the dura is not what we're trying to achieve and doesn't really achieve good results. So we can fix that. So this is after, that's before reoperation, reoperation with the dura now here, separated from the cerebellum and CSF between the cerebellum and the, and the dura. And then sometimes we see some really unfortunate things where there's been infection or CSF leak, the cerebellum gets in, really stuck to the overlying patch graft, there's pseudomeningocele, it's really stuck. Uh, we can usually help those patients with revision surgery, but it's, but it's really quite difficult. So for headache, it's, we don't know what we're trying to fix, but it does seem as though if you do get a good separation of the cerebellum from the, from the dura with CSF there and shrinking the tonsils, that the headache gets better. So the second thing is with syringomyelia uh, in relation to Chiari malformation. Again, I've been trying to answer this question for over 20 years, but I still don't know the answer, is how does the syrinx form in patients with Chiari malformation? Is it something to do with the CSF flow across the craniosubarchal junction? Is it the transmission of pulsations? Is it that stretching of the cerebellum pushing into the spine? How is it that those pulsations transmit fluid with presumably from the outside of the spinal cord onto the inside to form this cyst that gets bigger. What we do know though, is that for most patients who've had a posterior fossa decompression for Chiari malformation, that the syrinx will collapse. So it's clearly something to do with the physiology at the craniosubarchal junction that causes the syrinx, but we still don't really know what the underlying mechanism precisely is. And the problem with that is that Let's say we did a, an operation and the syrinx doesn't get better. How do you know what it is that you haven't achieved? Because if you don't know what it is you're trying to achieve in the first place and it doesn't work, then it's pretty tough to know what to do. So it's really important that we continue research and try to work out what the underlying mechanism is so that for those patients where it doesn't get better after surgery, we can perhaps work out why and then, uh, and then do something to fix it. I wanted to just talk a little bit about what a syrinx actually is. And I'll, this picture in the middle is a cross section of a normal spinal cord. There's the gray matter and on the outside is the white matter. But what I wanna draw your attention to is this tiny little dot in the middle here. That is a CSF space surrounded by ependymal cells. So it's just like the ventricles in the brain. That's a CSF space that's completely normal but so small that you don't see that on a normal MRI. So there is a central canal here, but you can't see it because it's so small. For patients with syringomyelia related to Chiari malformation, a syrinx is where that space becomes enlarged. And this is an example at post-mortem. And so what happens at post-mortem is that this, the cyst collapses, but in life, it would have looked like this. So really expanded, so it's gone from that little tiny channel to this enormous CSF space. And you might think, well, how does the person walk? But the reality is that what happens there is the spinal cord is actually stretched around that uh, CSF space. And so this person may have no symptoms whatsoever because that, the spinal cord is still completely intact around that CSF space. And so looking at the size of a syrinx 
doesn't really tell us whether it's necessarily likely to be symptomatic or not. They only become symptomatic if the CSF bursts through the lining. So remember I said there are some cells around the outside of the channel there. If the CSF space, the syrinx enlarges and those cells are still there and the normal spinal cord cells and fibres are still intact, nothing happens. But if the cyst bursts through that, it can start to damage the spinal cord tissue around it. And that's what this shows. So this is the central canal enlarged. It's burst through the spinal cord here. And so that part of the spinal cord is damaged. And what's important then to take away from that is that it's not the size of the syrinx that matters, it's where it is. So this is a patient, not a Chiari patient, but a patient with a very small syrinx. It's not the central canal. This syrinx is outside the central canal and damages the spinal cord, even though it's really small. And I see a lot of a lot of people ask me about, you know, how can my two millimeter syrinx cause symptoms? Well, it's all about where it is. If it's the central canal, like let's say it was not that big, it's only a couple of millimeters and it hasn't burst through, then it's not causing any symptoms. But if it's like this, it's likely to be causing symptoms. So the, looking at the MRI in detail is really very important in trying to understand these things. And if we look at the anatomy, um, the nerves that come into the spinal cord have fibers that run into the spinal cord and they cross to the other side and then go up to the brain. And so when a syrinx involves the middle of the spinal cord like this, it will tend to affect those nerve fibers as they're coming across to go to the other side. And characteristically, it's the, the nerves that control pain and temperature. And so a, a syrinx in the cervical spine or upper thoracic spine will affect uh, pain and temperature in this region, but not below, because below where the syrinx is, the nerves can still cross to the other side without being affected. And so just to reiterate, this syrinx is asymptomatic. These two syrinxes are symptomatic. Okay, so then when it comes to operating on Chiari patients who have syringomyelia, and we look come back, back to this uh, assessment of whether opening the dura makes a difference or not. Remember, opening the dura doesn't seem to make a big difference for headache, but it does for syringomyelia. And just the way this graph is organized, it's showing that opening the dura, putting a duroplasty in, has better results in terms of collapsing the syrinx. Um, I, I will I just go back a couple of slides. So if I just alluded to the success of an operation being collapse of the syrinx. So when this syrinx collapses, that's great because now it's no longer at risk of bursting through and damaging the spinal cord. When this syrinx collapses, that's also great because the person is not going to get any uh, on any further damage to the spinal cord. But where there has already been damage, that doesn't necessarily recover. So a collapse of the syrinx doesn't necessarily translate to symptomatic improvement. And in fact, patients can get worse because if the syrinx uh, damages this part of the spinal cord and then it collapses, that part of the spinal cord may start to recover. And the thing that recovers first is the pain transmission. So it's not common, but it does happen that successful treatment of the syrinx with collapse of the syrinx may actually result in the patient having worse pain. So you know, I, I'll always warn patients about that. Um, when it does happen, it usually gets better, but it can take a couple of years for it to, to do so. So my own experience is that with the technique that we use for Chiari patients, we've got almost 100% success in collapsing the syrinx. I've had only one patient where we've had to reoperate for the syrinx. But for the patients that I see where they've had their original surgery elsewhere, the kind of common theme, um, and we're in the process of publishing this, but the common theme is that the decompression hasn't been uh, large enough, that the, there is no CSF space between the cerebellum and the dura. And commonly that's because they've used a patch graft, an artificial patch graft that generates inflammation and makes the cerebellum stick to the patch graft. Or it could be that that inflammation causes scarring of the CSF space and particularly the 
the um, fourth ventricle. So here's, here's um, a, a patient who has a different type of syrinx. I'll just put this in so it's not a Chiari patient. So we don't know what the cause of this syrinx is. So supposedly it's what we would now call idiopathic. And I've treated this patient with a syrinx shunt just to show you that my goal in this surgery is to collapse the syrinx, not because I'm expecting any spinal cord damage to get better, but to prevent further damage from happening. And just some examples of patients that I've seen where the original surgery was elsewhere. So a big pseudomeningocele, the syrinx has come back, there's no CSF space between the dura and the cerebellum. Uh, and we can fix that. So if we revise that posterior fossa decompression and create a CSF space here, that's a metal plate. That's what it looks like that on an MRI. And the syrinx will get better. So there's something about creating a fluid space here that seems to resolve the syrinx. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about was cognitive dysfunction or, or brain fog. Um, it's real in Chiari patients. There's no question about that. I don't think there's publications now that I think are fairly convincing that this is a a real problem, not for every patient, but for many Chiari patients. But again, um, rather than focusing on what we can do about it, I think the initial question is what's causing it? And we don't know. Um, we're thinking that it's possibly also related to this cerebellar stretch problem. That as if the cerebellum is stretching with Chiari, that affects the signals or the connections between the cerebellum and the uh, other parts of the brain that definitely could be involved in cognitive uh, processes. And so it may be that um, if that's the underlying cause, that stopping those pulsations might help uh, brain, fog, brain fog. So we're doing some research at the moment, looking at these issues, doing neuropsychology tests for all our patients, looking at the cerebellar stretch, measuring it and seeing if that is related to improvement in cognitive dysfunction. So I can't give you any definite details at the moment, but I have definitely had patients who've had improvement in their cognitive function after decompression. I had a patient say to me, you must have thought I was crazy before, now I'm back to normal. Um, and so it's not isolated, it's not every patient, but it's, um, it definitely happens. Um, just quickly to the things we want to avoid, um, meningitis, obviously if you open the dura, meningitis is more common. And I want to just point to some of these papers looking at different types of patch graft. And there's a lot, there's a lot more different types of patch grafts than just these two, but the kinds of rates of meningitis and CSF leak that are quoted in these papers, 10% 10, 10 or more, are really unacceptable. Um, so you should not be getting that, that kind of infection rate for these surgeries. And certainly for the technique that we use here, um, avoiding uh, blood getting into the operative field. We don't use um, artificial grafts. We make sure it's a watertight closure and we just don't get meningitis. Uh, CSF leak and, and pseudomeningocele, it should be obvious getting a watertight closure is really important. Uh, some people would say, as I said, that that's an acceptable response, re result from surgery. I don't think anyone would say that one's acceptable, but I think that's not acceptable. Um, I'm not saying it's necessarily bad surgery, but you would look at, I would look at that and say, that's not what we're trying to achieve. And again, those, the rates that are published in the literature from some series are incredibly high. And if you talk to the people around the world who do many Chiari operations, they have nothing like this in terms of rates of pseudomeningocele CSF leak. It's much more like 1%. It's not that it never happens, but it's a, it's a much lower rate than, would, than some publications would talk about. So I'll just um, finish on slump. Uh, this is where the cerebellum and the brainstem has fallen through into the spine even more than the original Chiari. Um, we don't see that. We're careful about how much bony decompression we, we do. I put this picture in because this is a typical kind of textbook drawing showing the foramen magnum across here. And that what they show is the bone removal going outwards so that the width of the bony removal is greater across here than it is at the frame magnum. Well, our view is that the frame magnum is the whole point and that there is no need to have the bony removal more extensive above the frame magnum than at the frame magnum. And so our bony removal goes straight up and across like that. And I think that avoids slump. 
Um, this is tethering. So cerebellum is completely stuck to the underlying patch graft. This is what happens with every heartbeat. We definitely want to avoid that kind of problem. Um, I'm going to finish up there because I think my time is up and I want to be able to answer some questions. So um, I won't show the uh, operative video because some people tend to get put off by that. But this oh. final table is just to try and put it all together and say that of the different techniques that people are using, what what is the most useful? And I think that using a, a duroplasty with pericranium, resecting the tonsils, is the most likely to achieve what you're trying to achieve and avoiding the things that you want to avoid. But I just reiterate that we don't really know what it, what it is that's underlying all these problems. Okay, so thanks, Caitlin. Thank you. That was really good. Um, a little bit of questions, but I, I want to get to some of the questions that came in ahead. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to start with this one because it's pretty uh, sort of definitional. So how does someone know whether symptoms are being caused by Chiari, syringomyelia, or quote unquote fibromyalgia? Yeah, that's that's really difficult. I mean, I think for patients with what we would think of as very typical symptoms, so for Chiari malformation, that's a headache that's precipitated by coughing, sneezing, particularly laughing. I think laughing is really underestimated as a cause of headache in these patients, but that's a very typical uh, finding. But there are less typical things like hearing changes, the brain fog, pain in the neck and shoulder. These are quite non-specific, and it's hard to really pin that down. With a syrinx, uh, uh, I think perhaps it's a little bit easier because you can look at the MRIs and look for where the where the syrinx has burst through that lining, and that will usually match up with where the where the symptoms are. So uh, if it's in a certain spot and it matches up with where the pain or numbness is then that, that's related. To fibromyalgia though, of course, a lot of, a lot of these symptoms are overlapping. Um, so that's, it's a tough one. Um, I think it's always a matter of making, having a good clinical history and examination and matching it with the imaging studies. So you kind of talked about this a little bit, but a question came in about a smaller syrinx in the thoracic and lumbar area. And they were yep. asking about the types of symptoms. So specifically, climbing stairs is difficult. Chair, uh, sitting in chairs even hurts. Neuropathy in the feet. Is that um, pretty typical for that kind of a syrinx? Or? It's not. And that, you know, it, this is difficult because, uh, you know, patients with these kind of symptoms will obviously have a scan. And if a scan shows a, the central canal that's just a bit larger than normal, then the radiologist will say that's a syrinx. And then of course, everyone says, aha, that's the cause of the problem. Now it can be symptomatic. You can have, as I was trying to make, a, make the point that you can have a small syrinx that is causing symptoms, but you can generally tell from the MRI because it, you would expect to see it burst through this, the lining of the central canal, which you can do even if it's small and damage part of the spinal cord. But then, you would generally only expect the person to be symptomatic where that damage is, right? And so the, the nerve fibers that control movement, uh, control the strength of the muscles, are actually a long way away from the central canal. So it's not common for people, I mean, it definitely happens with very bad syrinxes, but it, it's really um, difficult to match up a small syrinx perhaps with a little bit of damage just next to the central canal, that's not likely to be causing weakness. It can definitely cause pain and sensory disturbance. And depending which way the damage goes, it could cause bladder control issues. That these are definitely things that can happen. But if the if the if the syrinx is small, there's no evidence of it bursting into the spinal cord and causing damage. I'd be suspicious that there's another cause for those symptoms. But again, these are difficult. So we'll often do um, somatosensory evoked potentials, electrophysiology testing to see if there is any spinal cord damage. I think that can be really useful. Um, we do those dynamic MRIs that I showed quite a few times in my talk to see if there is any uh, tethering of the spinal cord or, or other reason there that might be causing the symptoms. Mm 
That was going to be one of my next questions. So there was also a question that came in about um, they didn't, this patient didn't have Chiari, but they had had syringomyelia and occult tethered cord. And mm -hmm. the syrinx itself was considered kind of thinner, I guess. Um, and I guess the question was, how do you, first of all, diagnose that any symptoms are coming from that? Like I, that kind of speaks to it a little bit, but is there anything else that mm -hmm. someone who maybe has like a thinner syrinx, uh, how would someone do that? <laughs> Get yeah. So, um, so we, um, there's no doubt that tethered cord is one of the things that can cause a syrinx. But again, we don't know how, right? Um, and a tethered cord can cause symptoms without a syrinx. So um, it's true that when you have a patient with a syrinx with a tethered cord, you would want to treat them so that the syrinx collapsed. Um, but that may not necessarily deal with the symptoms. Um, the first step would always be to detether the cord, but if there was a persisting syrinx, you might end up having to put in a syrinx shunt. In terms of working it out, the, um, those dynamic MRIs are really useful to look at what the impact of the tethering is. Uh, electrophysiology studies to, to see if there is any um, uh, impact on signal transmission through the spinal cord is very useful for those patients. Um, a question came in the chat earlier. What what are the operative oh my goodness what are the operative statistics with a positive outcome for syringomyelia treatment? Do you know what those might be? So I can tell you. So I can tell you mine for the syrinx. So so I've had only one patient where we've had to reoperate. So it's close to a hundred percent for Chiari related syrinx. But that's a, that's that seems to be better than what gets published in the literature. Mm -hmm. And and I think that just points to the fact that we don't really know what it is we're trying to achieve. I think that if we create a good CSF space around the cerebellum, um, we don't have the cerebellum attached to the, the dura, we don't have a pseudomeningo seal, that the syrinx get, gets better. I can't tell you exactly why, but certainly in our experience it does. So um, I guess that's my only answer for that question so I see Mary's asking about idiopathic mm -hmm. depends what the what the treatment is so I, I showed you that example of an idiopathic syrinx where we put in a shunt um, we published our shunt series a couple of years ago and showed that um, for some of the it's only for the idiopathic ones uh, a, a shunt is 100% effective for the post-traumatic ones it's a bit more difficult because the scarring around the spinal cord can be so so significant that it keeps the spinal cord stuck on the dura. And so even though you've got the, the CSF draining out of the syrinx, the spinal cord may not collapse because it's stuck. But that's not the case for idiopathic ones. The idiopathic ones, there's, the subarachnoid space is normal, right? So we've, we have really good results with um, shunting for those patients. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, there's lots of other causes too, spinal cord tumors, uh, spinal cord compression, um, and generally treating the underlying condition will, will be effective for those. There's no doubt though, I mean, we see patients who've had their Chiari treated elsewhere and, and the syrinx doesn't get better. I showed you some examples of that. And it's, it's generally because what I would consider to be not an ideal technical result from the surgery. But the problem in this field is that I can't, and so I have, a, I have an idea of what I think is what we're trying to achieve, but I can't prove that to anyone. Right. <laughs> until we work out what it is that's causing all these problems. And so everyone does something different. People will have that, like a small pseudomeningus seal, say that's fine. Well, I don't think it is. And when they get recurrent syrinx, it's because of those reasons. Mm -hmm. there, actually, a question had come in a little bit ago asking, so after a successful decompression and a syrinx collapse, do you often see that syrinx reform later on and maybe, I guess, how long? They're, they're asking about what the reasons might be for something like that they imply. Discs yeah. kind of. I, I think I saw up. Bridget submitted that question. <laughs> so um, if there's a good, so I'll come back to this thing of, of what is a good technical result. So I have in my mind what is a good technical result and that, in, that is particularly related to the CSF space around the cerebellum and making sure that the cerebellum is not stuck to the dura. And when that's the case, I think the chance of syrinx recurrence is almost zero. Mm -hmm. 
and I've certainly never seen it in my patients. Um, I, the ones that I've seen from elsewhere, where they've come to see me after the syrinx has recurred, it's because of what I would consider to be a not an ideal technical result. Not enough CSF space, the uh, cerebellum stuck to the dura, pseudomen meningocele, these kinds of problems. So I'm pretty confident that if I see a patient in the post-operative scan with a good technical result, it's not going to change. Mm -hmm. Actually, a question that came in ahead, uh, it was asking sort of after surgery about how long does a patient really have to wait to start to see that syrinx start to shrink or, and like, when yeah, that's is a really long good question. before? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'd like to point out here that the, the whole CSF system is incredibly dynamic. The CSF is flying around the spine really rapidly and it's coming into the spinal cord all the time. So it must also be coming out, right? Because it's, it's, a, it's a, a balance, but there's rapid inflow and rapid outflow. And so when we're treating a syrinx, what we're doing is just upsetting that balance. And, you know, the volume of a syrinx might be 10 mils or 20 mils. And if you upset the balance by one mil an hour, it's going to be gone in a day. <laughs> so um, so it, it's, you know, in a sense, we'd like to get an M in one way, it'd be interesting to see an MRI every day for the next month after an operation, but we don't do that. I mean, let's say, for example, I do a syrinx shunt. And I, I can see that the syrinx has collapsed. I know that if I did an MRI straight after surgery, it would be collapsed, but that doesn't really help me. So I generally wait for three months for when we've done a, either a Chiari decompression or a syrinx shunt, we'll let everything stabilize and heal. And then the MRI at three months is, you know, tells us what's happened. The answer to the question though, is that I think for most cases, if you did the MRI the next day, it'd be gone. But the problem is, if you, like, let's say you did a Chiari operation and then you did an MRI the next day and the syrinx is gone, it's not stable. You know, it's not all healed up. And so it might make us feel good, but it doesn't really help. You still have to do an MRI three months. Mm -hmm. And I think when I talk to people around the world about what they do, that's pretty common. I think that's the general sort of approach that people have. And if those, if symptoms, I know you said that pain might actually worsen but if symptoms kind of are stable bef since before surgery, is that a good time, three months, to maybe go back in, or should you wait a little bit? I mean. Uh, well, hopefully you don't need to go back in. Really? <laughs> so, um, you mean if the pain gets worse? Um, well, yeah. if, if there's really no change or something. Um, I assume if the pain gets worse, maybe, like you say, that it's actually doing what it's supposed to be doing. but. Well, that's right, it can be a sign that the spinal cord is recovering. So um, I think if at three months you didn't, let's say at three months the, the, the syrinx um, was still there and there was not a good technical result from the Chiari surgery, that's when I, you know, I think it would be appropriate to consider further surgery. Okay. If there's a good technical result, I'd wait a bit longer. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. <laughs> A uh, question in the chat. Have you seen patients with Chiari end up with a twist to their body? And I imagine they mean some kind of like scoliosis. If you, what's that kind of a mechanism if it's Chiari specifically? Yeah, so um, I'll talk about the syrinx ones first. So when the Chiari causes a syrinx, if the syrinx interferes with the sensation or the motor fibers, to any of the muscles along the spine. So we think about we think about core muscles, right? The muscles inside the body running up and down the spine. All you need is a slight imbalance of the tone of those muscles, and it will make the spine start to tip. And once that starts, it'll continue. So uh, you know, I think it's pretty clear that it's the mechanism for a syrinx. And the literature, I think, would support the idea that if you if you have a patient with a scoliosis and you treat the syrinx, the chances of them uh, improving or at least not progressing are better than if you don't treat them, but it's not guaranteed because if the damage in the spinal cord is done, treating the syrinx, of course, hopefully stops further damage in the spinal cord, but if there is still that imbalance of tone, 
the scoliosis may get worse. So it's hard, if you think about it in an individual perspective, you know, it may seem like the odds aren't great, but if you think about it from a population perspective, you've 100 patients with a syrinx and scoliosis, 100 patients with a, where you operate and 100 patients with syrinx and scoliosis you don't operate, the ones we operate will be better, but not all of them will be, right? So that's, that, you know, if we think of it from a population perspective, individual patients, of course, think about it from their perspective, and they may not get better, but that's that just relates to the underlying problem. Now, for the Chiari, there are Chiari patients without syrinx who get scoliosis. And I, I don't think we understand the mechanism for that, but it is real. Um, it is, there is a higher incidence of scoliosis in Chiari patients. Presumably it's something to do with, a, again, a slight imbalance in the tone of the spinal muscles caused by the Chiari, but it's not as clear as with the syrinx patients. Um, you talked about pseudomeningocele a little bit. There was a question that was sent in. So um, a patient had had, I, I'm under, my understanding of this question is that they had had two decompression surgeries. The first, they had a pretty severe pseudomeningocele and they had uh, strict bed rest and it went away. And after the second decompression, it had come back and it's persistent two years later. Um, and it's actually causing similar kind of headaches to the original Chiari. So, and except now there are also kind of like postural triggers. So uh -huh. is that something that someone should be worried about, like a pseudomeningocele for two years? Is, is it causing any damage or is it okay? Not necessarily. I mean, I, it's, it's what I would consider to be not an ideal technical result. But if there's still a good CSF space between the cerebellum and the dura, then it's, it's probably okay. Um, but the problem is many times a pseudomeningocele will actually cause compression back of the dura onto the cerebellum. And, and often these patients have had, um, you know, they might have had a CSF leak, a bit of meningitis at the same time. And so they're much more likely to have scarring between the cerebellum and the dura, the patch graft. And so you might look at the scan and say, well, there's a pseudomeningocele. Yes, that's a problem, but it's only part of the story much more likely that the tethering of the cerebellum to the dura is the real problem. And I showed you some examples where we you can deal with that, but it's really, it can be difficult. And it's not, it's unfortunately not the same as doing the operation up the, the first time, because the scar, once there's scarring there, it'll never go away. It makes things a lot more difficult. But, you know, without knowing that person's exact scan appearances, I'd be thinking about, it sounds like the symptoms are bad enough to be thinking about doing something about it. And as I said, sometimes the original surgeon will think that, okay, there's a CSF space there, that's all you need, but it's in the wrong place. Mm, that's true. <laughs> um, an interesting question that was sent in earlier was, can you give any examples of underlying pressure problems that might be unmasked by a decompression surgery? And how can that be diagnosed and ruled out as potential problems? Yeah, that, another great question because this is a real clinical dilemma. And I showed some pictures of an example where um, um, often we'll see, we'll see a patient with headaches and the scan clearly shows a Chiari malformation, but the nature of the headaches is perhaps more suggestive of intracranial hypertension like benign intracranial hypertension or idiopathic intracranial hypertension, pseudochemia, whatever you guys, everyone calls it one of those things, right? So um, there's raised pressure. And it's difficult to know what to do with those patients. The problem is the Chiari malformation or the cerebellar descent makes it very difficult to manage them because you can't do lumbar punctures and you can't do other things. So my approach for those patients will generally be to treat the Chiari but tell them this may just be the beginning and that, that the real problem is hypertension and we're going to be going down a path afterwards. Um, and so that, I wouldn't say that's unmasked, like we're, we're, we know that ahead of time. Sometimes, uh, I guess it is possible sometimes that um, we're not aware of it ahead of time. We do the care operation and, that, and that then they have symptoms that are more like intracranial hypertension. I think that's less likely. I've certainly seen it problematic when patients, again, this thankfully hasn't really happened in our patients, but 
if they've had meningitis, CSF leak, pseudomeningocele, they're much more likely to develop hydrocephalus or intracranial pressure problems afterwards, requiring shunting. Um, I, I mean, I think the only patients I've had a good chance in is where they've actually had intracranial hypertension to start with, rather than as a result of those things. So there, there are two situations where you can unmask a, a pressure problem, but another one is if it's actually intracranial hypotension, meaning low pressure. So what can happen is in patients with a, a spontaneous CSF leak in the spine, and I see that one of the questions kind of hinted at that, uh, it can cause the cerebellum to fall down into the spine and on a scan look a bit like a Chiari malformation. If you operate on those patients, the cerebellum will go down further. And, and that's one of the reasons you can get slump. Um, and again, it's important to think about the, the nature of the headaches the patient's complaining of because uh, the CSF leak patients will have a very clear postural trigger to the headaches. And that would want to make you think about the possibility of a CSF leak. So yeah, possible unmasking of high pressure, possible unmasking of low pressure. Um, so you talked about this a little bit, and I this question always kind of comes up, and I think it's just, I, I want to bring it up. Um, mm -hmm. Cerebellar ectopia, just the term. <laughs> so what is that? Is it Chiari, or um, it, it, can you explain that a little bit? Because I, I know we don't have a ton explaining exactly what that means, and I know it scares a lot of people if they see it on an MRI, so. Um, yeah, and the... the it, it's an evolving thing, and as you know, uh, there's a lot of work being done around the world by different groups trying to be to clarify the diagnostic criteria for Chiari malformation. There's no doubt that cerebellum, cerebellar tonsils protruding into the spine is part of Chiari, but it's not the only story. The problem is that from a radiologist's perspective, they think it's simple. They think it's five millimeters, that's Chiari. 4.5 millimeters is not Chiari. It's clearly not that simple. Um, and although in some radiologists, they might say, well, it's four millimeters, so it's maybe a Chiari. Um, it can be four millimeters and be a very severe Chiari because there's no CSF space and the brain stem is compressed and the patient's very symptomatic. Or it could be four millimeters and be completely asymptomatic and not really a Chiari. So you've got to put the whole clinical story together and look at the features on the scan of not just the cerebellar ectopia, but particularly the CSF spaces. The dynamic scans that we do are very helpful, you know, looking at is the cerebellum stretching, is there CSF flow there? Uh, is it likely to be related to the symptoms? So I think the answer to the question is it's not simple. We're all working on trying to uh, clarify these issues. Um, but the relying on the measurement is is not the best thing. It's a much more complex story. Um, there are a couple of miscellaneous questions, but I wanted to do this one first since we're still sort of in the surgical realm. So after a quote unquote successful surgery uh, and a recovery for syringomyelia, a lot of patients will still have that pain, numbness, weakness, from especially if there's permanent damage. Um, so this question was really specific. So what treatments and therapies are likely to be helpful for treating those symptoms specifically? And what other specialists and even therapists do you recommend to kind of address these kinds of persistent problems after surgery? These are really, these are really difficult because as I was trying to explain, um, the goal of surgery is to make the syrinx collapse, to stop further damage to the cord uh, but it's clear that some patients will either have persisting uh, symptoms related to the underlying damage to the cord or the symptoms may get, may get worse. All right? there's, there's no doubt about that. And that's very difficult to manage. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't treat the syrinx, right? Um, because you want to stop further damage. Um, and managing particularly the pain, the pain arising from inside the spinal cord is one of the most difficult things to control. Uh, both with medication and, and any other thing. So it's very important to have a pain specialist as part of the team. We have, you know, thankfully we have good pain specialists and 
they're able to use the right um, you know, medications, uh, use stimulators where necessary. Um, so, but, but sometimes it's, you know, it's not able to be completely uh, resolved. So look, and we're all very sympathetic for these patients and we do what we can. Um, I guess the short answer is this, the pain specialist is the key for these patients. Is there, this one specifically asks about, um, actually, this is a really good question that I don't think we have anywhere. Is there a difference between a, a pain specialist and a palliative care specialist? Oh, yeah. It. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously palliative care um, in many cases would involve um, managing a person's pain. But but no, a pain specialist is is um, uh, dealing with patients who are you know they're not in a palliative situation they're in a expecting a normal life expectancy situation for these patients really and trying to improve their quality of life. Okay. So I, you know, I see that there's some crossover, but but they're really different. Yeah. Um, when would maybe a a patient dealing with this ongoing pain issue why would they reach out to like a PT or an occupational therapist? Um, what issues can those specific therapists help them kind of go forward in the future? Yeah, I, I was going to mention that before, but I, but it is a good question. I think that um, when you've got that sort of pain coming from inside the spinal cord, the more physical activity that you do, the the better things are. And it's not to say that it makes it makes it all better, but uh, you know it's a bit like um, being overweight and back pain. Like if if you're overweight and you've got back pain, if you lose weight, the back pain's not going to go away completely, but it'll be better than if you don't. <laughs> so um, so it's a bit a bit like that. So if you do good physiotherapy, build your core muscles, muscle tone is is good. You're physically fit. Aerobic exercise is good the impact of the pain arising from the spinal cord will be less than it would otherwise be. It's not going to go away. It's not going to be fixed completely, but it will be more manageable with good physical therapy. And then this question came up last week, so I'm going to ask it again, though, because um, last week was pretty pediatric focused. So um, as far as medications for treating this type of pain, I know it's kind of hard to do that. <laughs> is there, are there a particular type of medications that work better that you've noticed in this longer term situation? Yeah, again, so I, and I, I work with the pain, the pain specialists really drive that, but the yeah. but gabapentin uh, mm -hmm. is particularly helpful. Amitriptyline um, is other two kind of things that are particularly helpful. I mean, you want to avoid narcotic um, analgesia for well, for anything really, but for these patients, it's not it's not helpful in the long term. Mm. Um, okay, and then I, there are a couple of miscellaneous questions I wanted to get to. So, this one is: What symptoms would be caused by a perineural cyst? Yep. I, so, um, perineural cysts are really common, right? So, this is where the the spinal cord is surrounded by the the dura, the membrane around the spinal cord. And uh, at each at each level, the um, sorry, you, you just bit off my screen. So, so at each level, what it, I, thought, I thought maybe I'd, I'd close the meeting. No. So <laughs> the nerves come off the spinal cord and they go outside, right? So they they have to penetrate through that membrane. And, uh, and so the membrane goes out around the nerve and the CSF, the spinal fluid, goes around the nerve just for a few millimetres out into that nerve and then it stops. But sometimes that covering can just become a bit weaker or sometimes it gets a hole in it and there's a, the CSF space enlarges around it. So that's what a perineural cyst is. Very common very, and, and you almost always asymptomatic. And again, it's one of those things where people have symptoms and they get a scan, it shows a perineural cyst or a small syrinx, and it's very tempting to say, aha, that's my problem, we just need to fix it. And in many cases, it's not the problem. 
sometimes it is though. So um, a perineal cyst can cause a problem either by becoming large enough to cause pressure on that nerve, and then you would get pain or numbness or weakness in that where that nerve goes. Or the other thing that can happen is that that cyst can burst. And that's the reason that you might get, one of the reasons you might get a spontaneous spinal CSF leak and cause low pressure, which can make the cerebellum go down and make it look like a Chiari malformation. <laughs> so again, one of the problems of course, is that there's no test that tells you one way or the other that it's symptomatic or not. So it's very much putting the whole clinical picture together and working out, is this person's symptoms are they, do they match what we're seeing on the scan? Is that likely to be the cause? Um, so this last question that came in ahead, I'm going to ask it a different way and I apologize in advance if this is not your thing, but um, how, what is the cause of like the burning pain, stabbing kind of pain in the head? So how does that mechanism work? And um, just really basically, like it's really hard to explain, I think. And I, it's, it's worth explaining to people, I think. Yeah. I'm not sure that I've got a great answer to that question, but um, because there's different scenarios. But one is if someone's got a Chiari malformation and it hasn't been treated, and if they've got that kind of pain, I'd be suspicious that it's not directly related to the Chiari. Chiari. To, typically doesn't cause a burning kind of stabbing pain. If there's an associated syrinx, maybe, um, but generally not. That kind of pain is much more common in people who've had surgery, right? And, uh, and this can be related to occipital neuralgia because when you do a, a posterior fossa decompression, you have to separate the muscles to get to the bone. And the, in the process of retracting the skin and the muscles, you can stretch the occipital nerve. The occipital nerve comes up the back of the scalp. You stretch that, you can then cause uh, a problem with the nerve that then generates uh, occipital neuralgia. And that can be a burning kind of stabbing pain. And so for me, that would be the most common cause of that sort of, that sort of pain. Uh, I'm not sure the person answering the question is asking the question is um, had surgery or not. Um, but if they've had surgery, that would be the most most common cause. Okay. Um, so you talked about it again, this cerebellar stretching. I, I know you guys are looking into it right now. I mean, how much do we already know about the stretching of the cerebellum? And like, I, I, I think it's kind of interesting. I just wanted to know a little bit more. Oh, it's a new field, I think. Um, I mean, we were, we were looking at this in terms of trying to understand what causes a syrinx and as you'll know that some people will say it's the it's the piston-like action of the cerebellum that changes the pressure in the spine that causes a syrinx. Now it can't be that simple because pressure on the outside of the cord can't create a cyst on the inside of the cord. It's not physically possible so it's more complicated than that and so we were looking at the cerebellar motion from that point of view saying what if, what is this piston effect and so when we got these dynamic scans and we noticed that the, the cerebellum is stretching. And we then were, then realized that it was stretching more in the patients who had headaches. Mm -hmm. And so, so that has led us to think about that as a possible mechanism. And the more we look into it, the more it seems a plausible mechanism. And then it's potentially, as I say, even possibly related to the brain fog. I mean, how, it's, it's otherwise difficult to imagine how Chiari malformation can cause brain fog unless it's, you know, a person who's got chronic pain can have brain fog, sure. Um, but this seems more specific in Chiari patients, right? And there's studies showing that there are actually uh, structural changes that occur. And what would drive those? It, it might be the connections for this from the cerebellum that are affected by this, by this mechanism. Yeah, I just think that's really, Fascinating. So I look forward to that paper. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But I want to end today with just how can people get in touch with you? Um, I don't know anything about what how people are seeing patients in Australia. So <laughs> I guess uh, just let people know how they can get in touch with you if they need to be seen for an opinion. 
Yeah, um, look, I try to answer emails. Um, I don't always keep up. So, um, I mean, it, I, I don't mind being emailed. I can't have, you know, really long conversations. <laughs> try to keep up but certainly if patients want to see me then they can then they can contact us through the clinic and and now of course with COVID we've, we've become really quite accustomed to telehealth consultations so always happy for people to send scans and have a uh, consultation over over the internet um, so we've started doing that a fair bit and that's you know quite happy to do that okay. bearing in mind the time is going to be different but yeah it's what is it 11 a.m there now it's 11 30 a.m yeah Friday morning. <laughs> yep, <laughs> it's tomorrow. So, <laughs> bearing mm -hmm. that in mind. Right. Well, thank you, Dr. Sidley, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, I didn't have this one. Thank you for the great information from Nope. Um, right, this is really great. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Bye. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>